Thank you, Mother Sir. Um, uh, Dr. Kumar Swami, Professor Giridesh Pan, uh, Joseph Kachichem, and uh, many other uh, friends and colleagues here. Uh, I'm extremely happy to share some thoughts with you on a very broad topic on uh, contemporary discourses on Islam and modernity, um, which is a huge uh, debate over a fairly long period of time. Um, you know, starting from the early 19th century, you have that debate in place. Um, the, the whole question of reason and revelation, and revelation in, in Islam, the, the, the aspect of, of, of faith and the significance of the text, uh, and in this case, the holy book. Um, uh, it's very a, 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 a terrain in which, uh, uh, you know, we may doubt how to apply reason in matters of faith. And this question has been there for, for a long period of time. Um, the whole um, tradition of Egyptian modernity, uh, you have uh, students and intellectuals going to France, for example, the whole um, Anahda uh, happening uh, in the 19th century. You have uh, writings from Raphael Tartavi on uh, the Imam's experiences in, in, in Paris. Um, there is this question at that point of time, the linkages between Islam and Western modernity. Um, then you had a movement per se from Afghani onwards, Abdu in Russia, Derrida and others on um, you know, what's called Islamic modernism. Um, so Islam and modernity being placed together rather than as two separate identities. So that Islamic modernist tradition also is, is significant, Abdu's contribution in particular. Um, in the 20th century, particularly in the second half, we had the Iranian revolution, which uh, brought more interest in, in this topic of uh, Islam and modernity, but in particular Islam in the West, uh, which was also a question during colonial times, during the 19th century also. Uh, what Michel Foucault reporting on the Iranian revolution called the, the, the what was seen in the streets of uh, Iran was uh, religions play as uh, the spirit of the spiritless world. He was excited about it. Um, and was contrasting that with French Revolution, the, the secular moment. Uh, but what you were seeing in, in Iran was uh, the, the religious moment, uh, that kind of uh, religious, uh, not only religious frenzy from, from people, but religion as an informing idea uh, in modern revolutions. Um, that was the time again when, um, um, you know, Edward Said's book, Orientalism, came up and, and the whole debate on, um, you know, uh, the East and the West, uh, Islam and, and West in particular, uh, was happening in the epistemological realm. Then you had um, um, the 9-11 events again, uh, these questions coming up in a big manner. Um, and, um, you know, in recent decades, there was an upsurge of what is called post-secularism as, as such, the post-secular moment in, in Dabashi and others. Um, also in the Western world, earlier, you know, hardcore secular thinkers like uh, Charles Taylor and others, um, shifting to political theology, 
you had this this moment of accommodative religion in, in one's own thought now going back back to christian religious thought in europe um islamic thought in in the arab muslim world um and also in in iran in a, in a in a uh, considerable manner so this is the overall context in which we have to talk something about the islam modernity debate um and, and most of you know as is alasmas famous uh, work was islams and modernities in in plural um where one is not talking about a particular islam and a particular modernity you no know, diverse aspects of both these elements um what we find in in the intellectual work of uh, uh the the west asian and north african region is uh, uh the messing up of things you know? um traditional modernity sometimes working in such a ways that whether this is aspects of modernity or is this an aspect of tradition there will be lots of confusion in that um so sometimes tradition as modernity or some other times modernity as tradition so i was talking about the tradition of islamic modernism and so on so what is tradition and not what's modernity that that uh, uh, mixing up of things uh, is is a very interesting aspect and i i just would be concentrating on some of those elements uh, in this talk uh in the arab d- debates um in the intellectual debates and in, in intellectual discourses uh the ideas of turas and tajdid are are brought in uh to denote in a broader manner tradition and modernity um but they are also used by arab intellectual to denote heritage and renewal so um turas as heritage and tajdid as as renewal or modernity in that uh, sense of renewal but what is interesting is um, the the uh, the term turas and the term tajdid um it tajdid not as a a, a kind of um you know transcending turas or or something that replaces uh the torah but uh, tajdid as um the, the root of tajdid for example is from uh you know um the term you jaddid you know in in one of those hadiths that uh, we could see where um, there is a mujaddid a, a, a renewer coming in every 100 years or so that uh, so the term for modernity or for renewal is from the tradition itself from hadith um, so you could see that uh, you know modernity is not something that is viewed as european modernity per se uh, or uh, anything of that sort what uh, Muhammad Abid al-Jabri the famous Moroccan thinker talk about our modernity for him uh, that's the arab islamic modernity that uh, that particular aspect where there is some sense of um either continuity of a tradition or reworking of a tradition in order that they mean something today that that aspect is always stressed in in the very idea of tajdid um so that that aspect of jadid that that uh, more newer element is is what informs most of the intellectuals that uh, we are concerned with um the other main thing is the application of human reason uh the whole notion of ijtihad um 
where you interpret the text by utilizing um, reason. And reason, you know, is, is uh, a fundamental kind of uh, um, idea in, in modernity, whether it's European or, or otherwise. The attribution of reason is very important. Whether it's the tradition of uh, Al-Farabi in, in the um, you know, 10th century, or you know, Farabi himself was working on Plato and Aristotle, so that Aristotelian rationality on the other side, you have that tradition of uh, uh, you know, stressing on um, uh, rationality as an important intellectual endeavor um, in the Islamic tradition. Um, you have um, in, um, um, in the Mutasarite tradition, for example, in, in Islam, uh, a kind of emphasis, sometimes an overemphasis on, on, on the notion of reason. Um, and some of uh, the intellectuals like uh, Abid al-Jabri or Hassan Hanafi and others uh, sometimes call themselves as uh, neo mutasalites um, So contemporary intellectuals referring back to the Mutasali tradition in, 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 um, in um, a manner that rationality becomes a significant um, you know, focal point of their attention. Um, you have um, you know, writers whether it is Muhammad Abid al-Jabri or Hassan Hanafi or secular writers who wrote on Islam, the critique of religious reason, for example, by, um, you know, um, Jalal Lassam, Sadiq Jalal Lassam, the Syrian scholar who died in 2016, if my memory is correct. Um, the, these scholars, all of them, you know, worked on Kant, Immanuel Kant. Again, the notion of reason um, comes up in, in, in a big manner in, in these uh, people of uh, contemporary intellectual relevance. Um, you have intellectuals who had influence in recent times in, uh, in the Arab and Muslim world. Fatima Marnesi, for example, the famous Moroccan feminist thinker. Um, you see, Jabri, Hanafi, and uh, Marnesi all are Sorbonne educated, French educated. You have uh, Sadiq Jal Lassam, Yale educated. You have Abdul Karim Sarouj from Iran, um, London <laughs> educated, and so on. So, uh, most of these Islamic thinkers are um, basically. Uh, you know, having uh, close interaction with the Western world and Western modernity uh, in general. This was true with earlier intellectuals like uh, Ali Shariati in Iran and, and, and many others, or even Sayyid Qutb, uh, you know, whose writings on uh, the United States and the, and the West was, uh, you know, informed by his experiences in the Western world. Um, so what is interesting is, on the one hand, you had application of rationality for development of a discourse, which is intellectually enriching, and which is open-ended, in the sense that uh, that renewal is a continuing process rather than a closure. So that perpetuity of uh, renewal is what, uh, what makes it in interesting. But you also have seen in this interaction between, um, you know, Islam and Western modernity, there were closures coming up in certain intellectual effort. Said Qutb is a typical example for that. He was uh, talking about Western civilization as a whole, uh, as um, as Jahiliya, <laughs> who is in in uh, the period of ignorance. Uh, so the a whole civilization as ignorant civilization who, who needs rescue. Um, and that kind of interpretation 
you know, may not lead us uh, any further. That may be politically very significant and so on and so forth. But uh, there's a closure uh, evolving out of such interpretations of Islam and modernity that, uh, that happens. And this is to an extent, um, you know, applicable to Khomeinian thought and, and other things where Islam and West are placed in, in antithetical terms. Um, and, and you have uh, uh, this application of human reason for particular purposes of renewal, which is a continuing process. That, uh, that is some, somewhat denied in certain um, intellectual traditions in the region. But what interests us more is uh, that uh, freshness that application of reason uh, brings up as far as uh, religious ideas are concerned. Um, I've just talked about, uh, say, four um, in areas <clears throat> in, in very brief terms so that uh, uh, we can um, conclude this as early as possible and we have uh, discussion uh, and most of the time can be taken up for discussion. Um, the, the neomuthasalites that I was referring to, uh, Muhammad Abid al-Jabri and Hassan Hanafi, um, Jabri is no more, Hanafi um, is still active. Um, the, um, the idea there is in, in Jabri, what you, you see the, the notions like Arab reason. Um, when we hear such terms, you know, Arab reason, culturally specific, religiously informed notion of reason, of rationality, um, most people may immediately consider that as um, a kind of essentialist argument in, 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 in most sense. But he wanted to, to develop a kind of methodology through which the Arabo-Islamic culture terrain and its intellectual traditions brought forward so that specific ways of a standpoint from one's own soil, uh, but looking at the world, wider world, uh, with his own training in, in, in modern philosophies and, and ideas and his own participation in, in political matters and, and things of that sort. So a notion of Arab reason that is, um, you know, asserted in such a manner that uh, from an Arabo-Islamic background, you could see the world, you could uh, uh, interact with the world, and, and, and rationality helps in, in the process of connecting with the world, um, with the Western world, Western modernity, but in, in, in um, inventing or reinventing um, tradition or interpreting tradition in such a manner that uh, you have a renewal happening um, at the at the intellectual level. Um, you have um, you know people like Hassan Hanafi talking not only about you know that Saidian paradigm where he, Edward Said talks about the imaginative geography of um, the East and the West. Uh, the existence of, uh, uh, you know, the supposedly, uh, you know, ontological categories like East and West, and Said criticizes that ontological uh, explanation for these terms. These are uh, part and, you know, products of, uh, of uh, Orientalism as a discourse. So a discursive product in that sense, rather than uh, a predetermined a, a epistemo a, a, predetermined ontological categories um, and which was criticized you know by Sadiq Jalal Asham in a big manner uh, you know pointing towards the possibility of such uh, um, debates for the Islamic world to assert a kind of orientalism in reverse and you have seen such assertions in, in the Islamic world in a big manner uh, Hassan Hanafi's take on that was, uh, you no, know, he, he was strongly for an Occidentalism. 
a reverse orientalism for that matter, um, which was not a radical critique of Said or anything. It was a kind of uh, taking up from Said um, in a sense, uh, so that, you know, um, what Hanafi, like Jabri, was suggesting was a situated knowledge about the West, for example. Um, so one's own take on, on the West rather than, uh, you know, fixing oneself up in, in the dichotomous kind of situation of the East and West. You, you look at them from your standpoint. It's a kind of, uh, you know, what feminists usually call a strategic essentialism. It's an essentialism, but at the same time, it's strategically placed so that there is a writing back possible and, and, and things of that sort. Uh, what in Hanafi you could see his volumes on um, uh, Islam and the modern world, um, or his invitation for dialogue, or um, any of such, and Islam and revolution, and things of that sort, those kinds of works point towards um, uh, a, a situation where you have, on the one hand, different disciplines. You know, as a philosopher, um, um, sometimes that shifting to a sociological interpretation, a social scientific interpretation, to political interpretations, the, the notion of Islamic left, um, a kind of Islamic theology, which in the Iranian case was there in uh, Ali Shariati, for that matter. So you could see the notion of revolution used um, in, in, in the, uh, you know, from the traditions of Islam in such a manner that, you know, if a break comes up in a revolutionary sense, um, that may enable oneself in order to to have newer, fundamentally altered domain of interpretative knowledge. Um, and th that epistemological break is something that, uh, that uh, he cherishes in, in one way or, or the other. Um, the, the feminist contribution is a second thing apart from these new um, you know. If in Islamic modernism uh, and in this application of reason, as I pointed out earlier, if ijtihad was that hermeneutical exercise, applying reason was significant, it was in recent times used in much more meaningful ways by feminists. Um, the whole um, you know, sets of writings of Fatima Marnisi, for example, you know, Amin Abadul, Asma Barlas, and, and the whole range of uh, theorists, Keche Ali, and, and, and many others. Um, Fatima Madnis is ijtihad in one sense of the Hadith tradition, for example. Or Amin Abadul's uh, take on the Quran and the feminist reading of Quran, a kind of feminist ijtihad. Um, this was uh, very important in the sense, you know, when I started studying about, say, Egyptian feminism in, in the early 90s, um, there was, you know, every kind of feminism, they were just feminists. But now, because of the growth of Islamic feminism, the older kind of feminists have become secular feminists now. That's a new kind of term. Uh, so secular feminism as traditional feminism. Uh, in the Egyptian case, for example, um, Khuda Sharavi and others, Egyptian Feminist Union um, uh, in the 1920s, uh, um, uh, you know, the whole tradition of Islam uh, and, and that linkage with feminism, um, that is the, the broader uh, secular uh, label is now put on them. And the new uh, interpretations are Islamic feminists. So Islam as the, as the most modern <laughs> in, the, in the temporal sense of the term in, in that uh, feminist tradition. Um, so tradition in feminism as secular and 
the new kinds of feminism as uh, Islamic. Uh, so interesting kind of thing. Uh, and the interpretation, you know, using rationality, interpreting whether the whether Quran or the uh, hadith uh, sets of hadith, even um, you know, critically examining the very selection of hadith um, and and that tradition. Um, so you could see feminists evolving an epistemological ground based on their own uh, beliefs and cultures on which they can act uh, locally in their particular societies and wage movements and so on and so forth. So this is a, a second element. A third element is uh, the Shi examples, the Iranian case in particular, um, where you had, um, you know, Jalal Ahmed uh, writing on, um, like Occidentalism, uh, writing on Garb Sadaki, the, the West toxication or West struckness or Occidentosis, whatever it is called. Um, and you have, uh, you had uh, thinkers in the 70s, like uh, Ali Sharifi, again, French educated, um, you know, applying more or less a, a, a Marxist method even though there's criticism of Marxism in, um, um, you know, Shariati, but uh, you could see, you know, in, in the idea of class society and classless society, the power of Abel and the power of Cain, uh, that you could see classless and class societies and, and, and things of that sort. And, and Islamic left again, or, or Islamic liberation theology, as it was called, uh, was significant, and some uh, people attached to such ideas, not everyone, but some of them were mentioned as Islamic Marxists during that, that period, which is a term you can't hear anymore. But uh, that was also uh, there at that point of time. The interesting debate is between, um, in a sense, it's not a debate among themselves. They had enough debate. Uh, between Ali Shariati and the contemporary intellectual Abdul Karim Sarush, where uh, Sarush's uh, take on Shariati was that people like Shariati, intellectuals like Shariati, made Islam too obese, <laughs> you know, uh, put up lots of weight, <laughs> actually, um, because for everything, from politics to daily lives to what not, uh, Islam is, is brought in as um, a, an important tool for, not only for analysis, but also as an important resource for any kind of interpretation for that matter. And Abdul Karim Sarush as an Islamic intellectual in the Shi'i tradition is interested more in, in the otherworldly sense of Islam, not this worldly sense. Liberation theology is the disworldly sense of, uh, of uh, religion, of Islam. The otherworldly sense is important for Sarosh because, you know, you invoke um, religious ideas. You call God, for example, if you are a believer, uh, you know, seek an intervention in your, in your matter when you are in, in big crisis moral crisis, for example, or big laws. A society calls for religious principles when a society is in huge crisis. Um, it is on moments of uh, great, uh, you know, moral and ethical dilemmas that you invoke religion, not otherwise. And that is the way in which a secular life for people are possible. At the same time, a belief uh, you know, in the sense of that otherworldliness of religion, that is also possible. And 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 these kinds of you know, Sarur's whole idea of making Islam lean, you know, uh, you know, making it to do some exercises so that uh, it, it becomes lean. It, its application on every single matter, what we eat, to to uh, you know, all kinds of things that can be minimal. 
and uh, the the application of religious principles for very significant matters alone. So you can see in contemporary intellectual debates what you see is um, this mixing up, as I've mentioned earlier, of um, uh, tradition, modernity, where the demarcation is not very easily possible. Um, so, in a way, there are culturally specific ideas of, uh, you know, Occidentalism or our modernity, as Jabri mentions it, and, and so on and so forth. But Islam for them is, since it has that universalist character, um, so one need not necessarily be talking about that cultural specificity, even though that's a standpoint, that's from where you speak. Uh, but uh, universalist notions within the religion is what makes you to connect to other people. So it's not a closure by any means. Um, that renewal is always possible. Uh, and this kind of thinking is also against the notions of uh, you know, Islam and modernity ideas, which brings about closures, as I mentioned with examples earlier. So a rational hermeneutic uh, process or an ijtihad, uh, in that sense, is um, a tool uh, for making, um, you know, this continuous renewal possible. I'll stop there and I'll be very happy to take up uh, some questions and hear your comments.